I would like actually now to invite um, our first speaker, Adina Shapiro. Are you ready there in the car? Adina is a JFN board member. She's also the board member of uh, Bader Philanthropies and Mubadarat Foundation. And we we'll want you to, uh, to um, we want to invite you to talk about how the events, the, the events in May affected your thinking, thinking for the future, your strategy regarding philanthropy and what were your thoughts during that time? So Adina, please. So good morning, everyone, first of all. Um, sorry for my, uh, for my location, but I'm stopped on the side of the road. I, um, I actually, some of you can hear, I lost my voice. So I'm trying to uh, overcome that. But I think it's actually an um, opportunity to think back at, um, at uh, Moses, our, uh, the Jewish tradition, who also didn't have a voice. Can you hear me? Who said that he, he wasn't able to go on a mission because he, he, uh, he lacked voice. And God's response to him ask, asking, who gives a man speech? And I think that that's important because as a, you know, voices, having a voice is a privilege and the question as to whether you have a voice and whether a voice is the only thing that is uh, relevant to, um, to leadership is also, a, is also a question that's relevant to, uh, to ask at times like this. So that's, um, that's just my an opening remark. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of our strategy, we've uh, we've focused at Mubadarat on making services accessible to minority communities in Israel through different uh, through different areas, and we were less focused on the question of shared society. Although I see this as a relevant uh -huh. question to what it means to have a shared society but it is focusing on making uh, minority ser uh, services accessible to minorities. And for us, after the time of uh, the, acute, um, the acute difficulties or the acute uh, uh, confrontations, I would say then we deepened our strategy in two areas, one being the importance of inclusion and looking at inclusion in widespread Israeli societies that are supposed to provide services to all and what the challenges might be at times like that. And on the other hand, looking at the, at the nonprofits, at the Arab nonprofits that we support and how we make sure to hear their voices at this time and see how best to help them um, uh, fulfill their mission, even though it's a time where it's not obvious that they're able to, uh, that we see things eye to eye at, in, every, uh, in every respect. Uh, one final thing I will say at this time is that it's also, we have to recognize it's a time, a period, not just those two weeks, but overall a period of, uh, of certain uh, unrest and trauma for many communities, but also for the communities that we don't see and that's ongoing. And so we, as, people involved in philanthropies that can be leaders, we also have to be able to be mindful of the, the fact that there is a lot of unrest in all of our communities, the Jew, Jewish and the Arab communities in Israel. But as part of the Jewish community, then it's part of my responsibility as I see it, to see the unrest and the, where it, people feel unsettled in the community that's not my own, that I don't see in my closer circle. So that's in a, in a nutshell. Um, some of my thoughts. I think thank you. I was allotted five minutes. By... Yes, thank you, Abina. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge. Actually, I was going to say that's that's your challenge to stay within the framework of five minutes, because there's a lot to stay to say. But hopefully, in the breakout rooms, um, we will be able to go deeper into into that. Um, I first of all, I forgot to introduce myself. So. Uh, my name is Maya Foner, as you see, and uh, I'm the third Maya in the JFN uh, Israeli in the JFN Israeli staff. So it's uh, apparently a job requirement. 
Um, and uh, I joined uh, Reut actually in the program team. So uh, nice to meet you all. I'm slowly, slowly starting to remember the names and understand who everyone is. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to now introduce uh, to the two next speakers so that we'll have a, more of a flow and I won't have to stop in between. We're going to have uh, Reem Yunis. She's the founder of Kudra, the Arab Philanthropic Network in Israel. She's active in many boards and organizations that promote her passion about the three E's, education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And following Reem, we will um, have the pleasure of listening to Stuart Brown, who is the treasurer of the Naomi and Nehemia Cohen Fund, chair of American Friends of Hand in Hand, founding co-chair of the Social Venture Fund for Jewish Arab Equality and Shared Society. So again, your challenge is to speak for five minutes each. And uh, Reem, the stage is yours. Thank you, Maya. Great to see you, everyone. Good day. I mean, good day, wherever you are. So just since we're talking about the recent events, I personally wanted to share that last month was like for me it was a true grief like it, it was as if I it was a loss I lost someone the feeling was as if the morning morning for all the work that all all the people did during the last 20 years and as Maya said actually Alpha Omega philosophy of giving supported the three E's and we be, we believed that empowering economy and closing the gaps would help bringing us to, to a better place. But since the recent events, I personally understood that economic empowerment only is, is not enough. First, because the, the economic empowerment touches maybe the strong people, people with higher education, and somehow the weak people are, are staying behind. And I understood that we have so many ticking bombs in our in the Arab community, in addition to the violence and the crime that, that everyone talks about and we hear every day in the news. We have about 41% of our youngsters between the ages 18 to 21 that they, they have nothing to do. They neither study nor work. We have 30% of our uh, Arab villages and cities which are not connected properly to internet with 90% of Arab population in the employment age who lack digital skills, like they, do, they don't know how to write emails. And this is really, I mean, I believe by supporting the three E's that Alpha Omega did, the Imad and me did till now, I mean, I think we, we're not reaching this this part of, of people. And these weak people who, who live in poverty, in poverty, and we saw that these are the people who, who are angry and have nothing to lose. And especially, you know, after the Chokali Om, the national state. So this is why I started thinking that we, we must pay more attention to other things like culture and you know to preserving the arab language arabic language music theater libraries because people who consume these products are sensitive caring and also proud of of, of their culture and actually this is what i'm what i'm personally thinking about i still did not discuss it with lots of people but being part of kudra and i'm not the founder of kudra i'm a co-founder of kudra with with the, another six amazing partners uh, so i think that together we we can do much more and in, and impact the this this aspired change that we're looking for. Because each one from Kudra comes from different background with different network and with different dreams. But all of us want a better committee. So I believe that together we are much more stronger. Our voice is much higher and the impact would be greater. 
this is what I wanted to share with you, you know, thinking about last month. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reem. Thank you. Um, Stuart, we'd love to hear from you. As soon as I unmute my speaker, you'll hear from me. Yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to talk with you today. I, I have to start with an apology um, to all the people on this call, on this uh, webinar, Zoom, whatever, uh, who are in Israel, because what I'm going to say is may sound insensitive, and I, I don't mean it to be insensitive. I I appreciate that you all went through a very traumatic month, and in the past. I've been through other times here, which were traumatic, um, but I, there's nothing I can say to you today that is sort of a more personal that how, about how bad I feel for you. So what I can talk about today is what we're gonna do on a systemic basis and from across the ocean to try to be helpful. And so if it sounds insensitive, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the bottom line is we think we have the right strategy for dealing with, for, for addressing the problems that surfaced in May. And we're, the, we're not changing our strategy or, our, or, or the focus that we, that we have um, uh, for our philanthropy. Uh, the only thing we may do is increase the amounts that we uh, devote to it. Um, our focus in Israel is on building integrated education. And we've heard from enough people over a long enough period of time that the lack of effective integrated education is the fundamental reason why the divisions between the communities have persisted for so long um, in the context of a modern, modern country. And I believe that to be true. Um, and so we're trying to address that fundamental issue. Um, I wish we could have done more already, but we're not gonna change what we're focused on and we're gonna uh, do more in the future. We're, we're trying to take, again, I hope it doesn't sound insensitive, we're trying to take advantage of the reaction to the events in May to galvanize support for uh, a broader uh, range of approaches to integrated education by a broader range of actors, not just philanthropists, and not, pri not primarily philanthropists, but, primary, but actors in Israel from different social society, civil society organizations, different political parties, different business communities, and hopefully that, that reaction to the events will, will prove that this was actually a, a positive uh, in that it led people to realize how, how precarious the situation is if it's allowed to simply go on as it has been for, for so many years and that there is an urgent need for um, for action to address the fundamental cause of the division that's persisting between the communities. Um, the only thing I'll say in the end is that that's, that's sort of consistent with our approach, not only to philanthropy, but to um, raising our children. Um, we, um, when we, when our children were little, we had to teach them to wash their hands after they ate or after they went to the bathroom, et cetera. And the children always ask, how long do you wash your hands? And the answer that my wife, who's a physician, would give is, you wash your hands until they're clean. And so we are prepared to do whatever we can for as long as it's needed until the problem is solved. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, uh, thank you, uh, all three speakers, for bringing your uh, unique voice. And you don't have to apologize because uh, you know every everyone has their their unique voice, and uh, and that's what makes it so interesting and d a different perspective. Um, 
I would like to invite uh, Professor Ron Halperin, founder and co-chair of Accord Center, and Ron Gerlitz, executive director of the Accord Center, to uh, give us their presentation. Thank you, Maya. Um, so thanks, thanks for, for being here, and thanks for the, for the opportunity to, to join you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll talk for about 15 minutes, and then uh, Ron uh, uh, will, will add his uh, input in like additional 15 minutes. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but if you have questions on, you can write us on chat or, or in any other way, and we'll be happy to address it. I want to say, at least, at least regarding my part, uh, you know, I usually provide, and that's what I'm going to do today, uh, like, like an analysis of the situation from, from the perspective of someone who's an expert in, in intergroup relations, specifically on issues related to the uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish Arab relations in Israel. Uh, I will say that I think that in these times, I, I, I should and I will be modest in, in what I'm saying. Because I think, you know, we went through some very, very challenging days. Uh, anyone who's dealing with these issues, and you know, this is what we do from the minute we wake up in the morning, almost to the time we go to sleep, uh, uh, learn a lesson in, in modesty, I think. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't, uh, the, the times weren't, weren't easy times, but I do have some insights and I want to I share them with you, uh, and maybe to broaden our perspective on, on, on that situation. And then Ron will give us some more specific recommendations. And I want to, I want my, my presentation will have two parts. The first part, and I think that, I mean, I don't think that we can talk about an analysis of the situation without providing the context. The context is really, really important. And when I talk about the context, what I mean is, where were we, you know, Jews and Arabs in Israel before these recent events began? And I think that, and you'll see, that almost everything that I'm going to say in terms of the analysis of the events themselves, their antecedents, and maybe their you know, outcomes and implications is related to the, to the context of the events themselves. So one thing that should be said is, you know, these events happen against the backdrop of, of some very, very meaningful changes in the area of Jewish-Arab relations within the Israeli society. First, and, and, and many of you know that because many of you are involved in these processes, the interaction between Jews and Arabs on, in, in daily life in Israel, when we think about the academia, when we think about business organizations, is increasing substantially over the years. It means that you know, we are today, or when, when the events started, we were in a situation that, in a situation that is very, very different than the place we were at, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes ago, 10 or 15 years ago, sorry. Jews and Arabs, more and more Jews and Arabs meet each other in their, in their uh, workplaces. More and more Jewish and Arab students are interacting with each other. It means that there are some you know, personal relationship, some, some successes, some failures, some expectations, Things that, you know, we couldn't have said the same things a decade or, or, or 15 years ago. And this is dramatic. This is dramatic because it means that there are already some meaningful interactions between people from these two groups before we entered this quite dramatic and violent phase. It also means that there is something that is very important when we social psychologists look at you know, intergroup relations that is called intergroup interdependence. In many, many, many ways, when you think about it, you know, I see it in my university, but I also heard it from, you know, CEOs in business organizations. These groups are already dependent upon each other. And this happened before the events started or erupted. And this is very, very, very important. Another layer, to this, to this context that we should take into account is that there was a very, very, I would call it positive, but very meaningful trend towards what we call political partnership between Jews and Arabs. It wasn't necessarily, or it isn't necessarily a linear trend, but we see positive changes 
towards you know negotiation between Gantz and the Arab parties and Netanyahu declared about some cooperation or collaboration with Arab parties. Now we see Ram that is part of the coalition. So it's not just social interaction between Jews and Arabs in the academia, business organizations, etc. We also see a trend towards political partnership, which is a very, very, very important trend. And in order for us to understand the current events, we need to understand that this is what happened before that. A third point that I think that should be said, and keep that in mind uh, 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 when, I, when I'm going to talk about the events themselves, is that most of these changes, both in the economic sector, academia, politics, almost everywhere, were driven by what I would call more instrumental consideration, or, or, or you know, the business case in the, in the business sector, uh, uh, even the Rivlin vision was based on the fact, you know, we have four tribes here, we have to live together somehow, okay? Uh, the political issues or political partnership was driven in many ways by, you know, by, by instrumental considerations, which means, you know, it's not about a Palestinian identity, it's not about the ethos of the narratives of both parts, it's about, you know, our, our instrumental goals as, 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 as Arabs or as Jews. And the last thing I would say in terms of the context is when we look at both societies, again, before the recent events, we saw, and, and it's, you know, it's well known, the, the radicalization and, 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 and the violence within the Arab society in terms of you know, crime and violence, internal crime and violence within the Arab society on the one hand, and on the other hand, in the Israeli society, in the Israeli Jewish society, a, an increased legitimization for the most radical right-wing extremist. You can see you know, the, the legitimization that Prime Minister Netanyahu gave to Ben Gvir and his, and, and his party during the last election. And these two processes are very, very meaningful when we think about you know, analyzing current events. So, so against this backdrop, this is, this is the context, at least the way I see it, for the eruption of these recent events. And now I'll talk about three main points. Again, I, I'm sure we will not all agree on everything that I'm going to say, but three main issues, maybe, maybe I'll add a fourth point if we will have time, that for me helps me to understand or analyze the, 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 the events. The first point, and it's not going to be easy for many of us to hear, but I think that Rim said something quite similar to what I'm going to say right now. But from the perspective of, 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 of a social psychologist, this is very, very clear. I would call it the collapse of the, call it the big deal between the Israeli government and some segments within the Arab society, basically saying, we will give you or support you in an economic way, and you'll give up some aspects of your identity, Palestinian identity, narratives, ethos of the Palestinian or Arab society. This is something that, it, at least the way I see it, simply collapsed during the last events. I would say, you know, and those of you who know us in accord, We've been saying it for a very, very, very long time. This simply cannot work. And we thought that it cannot work even before the last event, but the last, last but the, the recent event simply, you know, further highlighted the, the, the problematic, this problematic situation. And I'll say it very clearly and very simply. Everything we know about trying to bring people from different conflictual groups together tells us that it happens only, only when the, the different groups feel, con feel confidence in their own identities. Only when the groups feel confidence in their own identities. The very, very basic idea that the Arab society would be integrated into the general Israeli society by, you know, economic, financial incentives, 
uh, infrastructure development, but giving up the basic idea of their narrative and identity, it simply cannot work. And I think that what we, we saw during the last events exemplified in, in, in the best way I, I, I can think of. Again, we didn't want such a thing to happen, but this is, this is a very clear proof to this situation. Now, it doesn't mean that there, there's no need for you know, economic development, infrastructure, education, and everything, but it shouldn't come on the expense of a Palestinian, a confidence in Arab Palestinian culture and identity. And, and I think that the, the, the recent event show, showed it very, very, in, in, in a very clear way. The second, the second uh, 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 insight that, that I have is the huge influence of what, what we call process of failed expectations. And, and, and think about it for a second, everything that I've described before, when I talked about the context, describe the process of more or increased interaction, increased understanding. And this process also lead to increase in expectations. And what we've heard from many Jews and Arabs in Israel during the last events was, we simply cannot understand how they, the other group, fail to understand our fears, our concern, our perspective on this situation. And this is part of a, of, of a backlash that we often see when tensions between groups that are in, in, in somewhat, some situation of conflict are, are improving. So there are more, more, <laughs> more expectations. And then when such events, events suddenly occur, then failed expectations create really, really, really negative emotions. And this is what led, at least partially, what led to the further radicalization of the events when they started to, uh, 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 to, to happen. And the third point, which is just for me, uh, is, is a very important point. And I think that Ron will take it uh, to his more like practical uh, 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 suggestions later on, is that I think that many of us underestimated the role or the potential implications of what we call in our you know, scientific language, the spoilers in both societies. We, we tend to focus you know, the mainstream of both societies, both Arabs and Jews. And we always say, you know, and there are these extremists on you know, the Jewish society and on the Arab society, but if we will mobilize the mainstreams among both societies, everything would be, would be okay. And I think that we underestimated, A, the potential destructive role that these spoilers, both the Jewish ones and the Arabs one, can play in this process of you know, improving the relations between Jews and Arabs in, 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 in this context. But also, we failed to acknowledge the huge threat, the huge perceived threat that is experienced by these spoilers from both societies. Just think to yourself, how threatening is this, are, are these changes, the more integrations of Arabs within the Israeli academy, politics, business sector, et cetera, et cetera, how threatening this can be to the spoilers or to the more radical forces within both societies or within both groups. And I think that what we saw during these events is how destructive and how terrible can be the implications of this perceived threat of spoilers on both sides of this, of this, of this uh, uh, conflict. I have some more ideas, but I think that I'll stop here. And my challenge was to speak in 15 minutes. So it's not, you know, the same challenge as you had at the beginning in talking in five minutes, but I want to leave enough time for one. So if we'll have more time at the end, I'm happy to take some, some questions. On. Thanks, Kudai Iran. So first, thanks JFN for inviting us. I'm really very happy to be here. And I'm also happy to see some long time good friends. Um, 
I would like to, to share with you, um, following our previous discussion with Jeff and staff in Israel, where, where we see uh, opportunities for uh, civil society and for uh, philanthropy, opportunities that following what happened can be utilized first to continue building the, the foundation for shared and equal society, and also and maybe not less important to minimize the risk of having another cycle of such uh, civilian violence as we saw in the streets in Israel in the uh, previous months. Uh, and the opportunities I'm going to share with you are based on, on the analysis that Iran just presented and also on my previous experience in the Jewish Arab uh, field. So I want to present uh, seven points. The first point is that during the, during the escalation, which was really the, the, the worst violence between Jews and Arabs since 1948, uh, inside Israel, of course, I mean, um, we see uh, um, many factors in the Israeli society that previously didn't make a public voice about Jewish-Arab relation, making a public voice, and I'm speaking mainly about public institutions like universities and other public institutions, and mainly, mainly about pri private firms that went public, some with really big ads in the Israeli media and even in the Israeli streets, calling uh, against the violence and, and for a shared society between Jews and Arabs. This was a, a positive response of important factors in the Israeli society, and again, mainly in the business sectors. Uh, and we could even see a kind of uh, a positive norms that was created during the escalation, because it began with some universities and some uh, business, uh, with some. Uh, private firms, and then we see more and more join in making a clear and loud voice uh, for shared society and against the violence. And, and I think is that the opportunity is that, that maybe there are new players that previously didn't see themselves as obligated and as part of the struggle for equal and shared society. I mean, maybe we have new players that can join us in the, in the, in the effort to create a, a equal and shared society between Jews and Arabs in Israel. My second point uh, is uh, that I think that what happened, uh, and especially what uh, many of the things that Iran described, is, is a call for all of us to um, explicitly take care of the relation between Jewish and Arab in the shared spaces, especially in the main shared places for Jews and Arabs, which is the employment, employment market and the academia. These, those are the main places in Israel where many Jews and Arabs are meeting on a regular basis and for a long meeting. When people are learning together or work together, so of course the encounter is is long and uh, and, and, and significant. And we think that it is important to explicitly take care of the relation between Jews and Arabs in those, in those places because of the tension that existed in the shared spaces. Uh, and and leaders and, and and directors and CEOs, for example, in private companies and other places who previously didn't want to explicitly deal with those relations. Now, and now understand that they simply cannot ignore it. Many of them approached us in a call during the time of escalation, especially from private firms and from the academia, and they simply asked for help because a relation that went on a normal for years literally almost exploded, okay? Or exploded without violence during the time of this escalation. And they asked for help. And, and, and those are people previously didn't see themselves as responsible for the relation between Jewish and Arabs, for example, in the campus or in the private companies that they own. And now they understand that they, mu they must take care of those relations. And they think that the opportunity can be utilized by providing tools to them to, to, do, to do so, to take care of the relation in three points of time. During escalation, immediately after, in a post-escalation time like we are now, and also in regular times that we all hope that will uh, will arrive. And of course, it is a challenge. Uh, in accord, we are now developing a, a conceptual model that should be of help to those in the field, in the shared places that want to go in this direction to understand better what happened between Jews, Jews and Arabs in the shared places and to address the, 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 the direct and to explicitly address the uh, relation between Jews and Arabs. My third point is very much related, and it's also very much uh, based on what Iran described, is that the national aspects of Jewish-Arab relation 
should be taken care of. Because I think that now more and more people understand it is not only a majority minority relation, but there is a national conflict between Jews and Arabs in Israel, and there is conflict of identities. And in the shared spaces, again, I'm speaking mainly about uh, uh, the employment places and academia. Many people, for example, employers opt uh, or even assumed wrongly that the national conflict stop at the door of the shared spaces. You can even hear employers say, I don't know even you know, who are Jews and who are Arabs from our employees. I mean, you, you, can, you could hear those statements. Uh, uh, other knew that the, the national uh, conflict is there, but they choose not to address it directly, either because they thought it's not the right thing to do, or because they didn't have the tools and knowledge to address it, or simply because they were afraid to touch this sensitive issue. Um, but as Iran mentioned, uh, national identity is important, uh, and healthy relation between Jews and Arabs must be must be based on securing the self identity of both groups of Jews and Arabs. And in the case of Arab citizens, it means securing the Palestinian identity, or at least give a legitimation to the Palestinian identity of many of the Arab citizens, and ignoring the the national ignoring the self-identity, ignoring the self-identity, I'm sorry, ignoring the national identity, or in some cases even worse, trying to fight against it. And there are factors in the Israeli society that are trying to fight against the national identity of the Arab citizens um, is, 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 is something, it's a bad practice that we've seen for years, especially ignoring this, this fact. And I think it becomes more clear uh, that Arab citizens are not ready to give up their national identity, and the national identity is 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 important in the way that they see the world and behave in the Israel in the in the shared spaces and in Israel. Uh, and I think that the, the the opportunity and also maybe the obligation of the Jewish side is now to move one step forward in recognizing this identity. Uh, and I agree that maybe the new coalition uh, give us back wind for that. If the current Israeli government and the current Israeli prime minister, who is not the most leftist guy in Israel, and if he has in his coalition an Arab party of uh, Arab member of parliament that recognize themselves as Palestinian, so maybe the, uh, the, the private CEO of a company can also let himself recognize and give legitimation to the identity of the Arab citizens. But anyway, it will require strong leadership from the side of the leaders of the shared spaces, and also of NGOs and philanthropy that are doing efforts in this direction, and especially because there are counter forces that, unlike us, don't think it is important to give legitimacy to the uh, national identity of the, of the Arab citizens. Uh, of course, tools and guidance should be uh, provided and given to those in the field that are in the front of these uh, conflictual identities. Um, my fourth point is relating to which part of the Arab society uh, investment went so far and, 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 and which part of the Arab society is the one that should get, uh, maybe should get now priority in uh, different investment. And it is very much related to what Rim uh, said in the beginning. Um, I, I'm not sure it's a new opportunity, but for sure, I think that what EPEN teaches us that investing in the lower and weaker socioeconomic part of the Arab society is a critical thing. And, and I want to say something, and I want to mention that the efforts to integrate Arabs in the higher part of the Israeli society, especially in ITEC and academia, they were successful in the recent decade, and I think they were very important. I, I, I myself, I was also part of leading such efforts, and I think we should all be proud of the really big achievements uh, of integrating the more higher parts of the Arab society into academia and high tech and other high paying jobs. But I think we need to ask ourselves very honestly, maybe we were so excited, excited from those achievements that we didn't succeed to see those parts in the Arab society that were totally, totally left behind. You know, for the Arab young guy in Lod that come from family and risk, at risk, and and learn in a school system that is severely underfunded compared to Jewish schools and has no informal education services. This young Arab guy, he wasn't influenced from all the important processes 
of integrating the Arab society into academia and high tech. And those that went to throw stones at Jews in Yafo, in Akko, and, and in Lod, those were not Arab PhD students in the Hebrew University. They were, those were also not the Arab pharmacists in the super farms in Israel. They were those, and we know it, that there were those young guys that had nothing to do and nothing to lose. And then this, I really repeat what Rim said in the beginning, and that the country, the country, and also I think in our circles, invested very few in giving them uh, opportunity. And, and I want to say something a little bit sensitive. Uh, we know that IPADO group, and in that context, I think Jews uh, in Israel and also maybe uh, uh, the Jewish part of the philanthropy always want to feel moral. And maybe we put so a lot of efforts in places that help us see ourselves as moral, uh, like opening the gates of the academy and opening the gates of ITEC, which again, I can't emphasize how important it was, but it also gives us the picture that we are going in the right direction, which was correct. And maybe as my kids will have opportunity to go to elite university in Israel, so it is correct that now many Arab kids has an opportunity to go to uh, universities in Israel. But again, for many Arab young guys, uh, that uh, that not this is not even an option uh, because the uh, background doesn't enable them any chance to go to those places. And I think that what happened. Uh, teaches us if we want to build uh, equal and just society, and if we want to avoid a future cycle of violence, efforts must, must be put also on the weakest parts of the Arab society. I, I would like to mention in my uh, three last points, I have more five minutes, so I think it will be okay. You have uh, even six and seven, that's fine. Excuse me? You have even six and seven minutes, that's fine, go okay. ahead. Okay, okay, perfect, thanks, Tuda. Um, um, I would like to mention three points that are related to policy. Um, first, I think that um, pushing the Israeli government for having uh, what we call nine to three, a continuation program for nine to two, a new uh, governmental decision for equalized budget for Arab, for Arab citizens, there is now a very big opportunity, maybe similar to the opportunity that we had in 2015, because of the long time economic interest that you all know, and because that uh, this new governmental 923 program is part of the coalition agreement uh, between Ram and the other parties in the, in, the, in the government, there is opportunity for a large scale 923 that can take us forward in closing another big chunk of gaps between Jews and Arabs, and promote a social economic situation in the Arab society, uh, I would do uh, all efforts to utilize this opportunity. I, I want to mention that I think that special efforts should be put to ensure that informal education will get enough budget and that infrastructure for informal education will be built in the Arab communities, especially in the mixed cities. It doesn't make any sense that young Arab kids are literally in the streets in those places and doesn't enjoy even basic informal education. Uh, there is only single factor that can close this gap, it is the Israeli government. And I would put all efforts that in nine to three, uh, uh, informal education will be a big chunk that will cause an influence on the Israeli society and on the Arab society, of course. My next point related to policy is education for shared society. The situation and level of education for shared society in the Israeli education system is very bad. The amount of resources that are uh, put in education for shared society is extremely low, low. And this is not new. This is something that we saw for decades, uh, or maybe for two decades. It was different. Uh, uh, the situation was totally different two decades ago during the Rabin government, uh, actually 25 years ago. I think that now there is an opportunity uh, for increasing uh, uh, education for shared society into the education system in Israel. I think there is opportunity because of two reasons. One reason is that I think that we all saw in Israel what happens when there is an education for shared society and, 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 the, and, the, and, and what happens at the level of aid between Jews and Arabs are so high. And people in Israel saw it and people understand that, uh, uh, that something must be done in the education system to teach uh, 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 students and kids from all sides 
to hate less and respect more the other side. And, and the, the another reason there is opportunity is that I don't know uh, how many of you, how many of you know, but the new minister of education, she has uh, she made her PhD in peace education, and her dissertation is very uh, explicit about the importance of teaching education for shared society and even peace education. I, I want to say that I hope that the, this opportunity will be translated into effective efforts to push the Ministry of Education to promote large-scale education for shared society in the school system. I think that for too many years, NGOs and philanthropy, unfortunately, replaced the Israeli government in funding education for shared society. The result is unfortunately low number of students that experience education for shared society. I think it is now the opportunity and maybe also the obligation on our side to cause the Minister of Education to promote education for shared society. I think it is doable. My last point is, uh, is very far maybe from social psychology, but a, a very strong effect on Arab society. And this is the shortage of credit to Arab society. I assume that some of you are aware of this very severe problem of shortage to credit to Arab society. It has dramatic bad effect on Arab economy and the social, socio-economic situation of Arab citizens. And it is also the fuel of the crime in the Arab society. And the crime in the Arab society is one of the things that fuels the violence in the Arab society and fuels the violence between Jews and Arabs. Uh, some people say that the majority of Arabs that were participated in the violence between Jews and Arabs were belong to the crime circles in, uh, uh, in the Arab society. So for many years, the efforts of philanthropy of NGOs to address this challenge were by different loan forms. I think that many understand now that it is an ineffective effort. I'm sorry if I'm too sharp. And <laughs> it is like trying to empty the ocean with, with a spoon. It won't succeed. Uh, it is only clever regulation that can encourage uh, the banks in Israel to give credit to Arab citizens. This is the only thing that can solve the problem. Uh, on your side of the ocean, at least uh, people here from the States, there is the CRA, the Community Re Reinvestment Act, which is successful in the USA in causing banks to provide significant credit to sectors in the society that suffers from shortage of credit. And I think that in Israel, significant effort should be put in this direction if we want to solve the shortage of credit to Arab society and all the strong bad implication of it. That's it, I will just sum up. Uh, yes, answering your question of uh, Ophir, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, to, what you, to the availability of credit, of financial credit for a business and private people in the Arab society. So I'll just sum up and I will say that I think that it is what we learn from what happened teaches us that it is important to address the challenge of Jewish-Arab relation in the third places and give leaders and managers tools to do so, including, including paying attention to the national aspect of the, aspect of the relation. I think it is important to take care of the lower socioeconomic parts of the Arab society. And I also mentioned three policies that I think that now it is an opportunity to promote, nine to three, education for shared society and taking care of the shortage of credit. I think that those steps are critical if we want to avoid next cycle of, scale, of escalation, or at least being able to stop it fast when it happens again. Maya Bevakasha. Thank you. Yeah, I had to unmute. Thank you very much to both of you, Iran and Ron. I want to open the floor for uh, questions. Um, there are questions that were written in the chat, and you're also uh, invited to raise your uh, Zoom hand if you have a question to direct to either Ron or Iran or both of them. He has a question, right? Should I ask what type of informal education uh, we are recommending and uh, if I can be specific about education for short society? So it's, it's long, I try to do it very short. Informal education can have two types. One is youth movement and second is community center. In the Jewish side in Israel, uh, Youth movement relatively uh, are, uh, are strong and scores maybe hundreds of thousands of, of no, for sure hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Jewish kids enjoy uh, youth movements and community centers in the Jewish cities. In the Arab society, there, is, there was nothing a few years ago. Now it is the beginning of, uh, of youth movement and community center, what we call in Israel, Matnasim, in the Arab society. 
And this is the kind of informal education that the government should fund in the, uh, in the Arab communities and for Arab in the mixed cities. Uh, about education for shared society, well, uh, it will be difficult for me to, to be specific. I, I will just say that uh, the knowledge that we hold in social psychology and another knowledge that exists for decades teaches us that it is, it is possible to teach kids to be more uh, tolerant and more respectful and to aid less the other groups, even groups in conflict. It requires a lot of efforts and a lot of budget to have those uh, pedagogical things part of the education system and part of the things that are being taught in schools. Israel invested a lot of money in the, in the 90s and it was proven successful. In the recent years, there are many programs, including of Accord, but of also of many other uh, programs that were proven successful but the Ministry of Education should decide and allocate funds that it will be all over the education system. Right now, it is, it is in a very limited amount of places. I'm here, I can actually just ask my question. Okay, great. Uh, so the question, um, Iran had brought up uh, the extremist voices and the, the, uh, uh, the, their ability to spoil forward momentum and also their own, uh, how forward momentum threatens their own um, existence. So I'm curious, and I, that, that was not an issue that Ron then responded to. So I'm curious if Iran and Ron have any thoughts about what to do vis-a-vis -vis the spoilers. Okay, so, so uh... I'll say two things. I think it's, 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 a, it's a very, very important question, but I'll say two things. One is that, and I know that it's not an answer to your question, Sarah, but I will say, the first thing is that I really think that we should, I mean, we should pay attention. It's part of, I mean, our, you know, thoughts, our, our activities should somehow think of ways to address this challenge. And it's not something that we've done up until now. But more specifically, and I, and I know that what I'm gonna say right now might not sound very nice, but I will say, it. I think that, you know, we tend to be very, very nice when we think about, you know, shared society, bringing together Jews and Arabs, very positive in, in almost everything that we do. I think that part of our, ro our role, given our understanding of, you know, how powerful spoilers are, is to delegitimize spoilers. And it should be part of our agenda. So it's much nicer, I would say, you know, to promote education for shared society in schools, okay? And it's less nice, okay? Or it, it's outside of our comfort zone to say that we should exclude from the social, you know, from the norms within the Israeli society, people who are racist, people who are calling for exclusion of Arabs from you know, the, 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 Jew, the Jewish society or the political uh, uh, discourse within Israel. And I think that it sh this should be part of what we want to do. And it's not something that we do enough. We should be much more proactive. And I think that what, what's happening now, for example, with uh, Ben Gvir and his like, like, like group is something that we simply cannot afford. And there are equivalent forces within the Arab society. And I think that this, is, this, is, this should be part of our agenda. And, and again, I know that it, it feels much more comfortable to all of us to promote you know, the nicer and, and easier things within, within these processes. But, but, I, but I truly believe, and you know, Ron and I are talking about it for, for a long time, this should be part of, our, part of what we do. Because otherwise, our efforts are simply, or part of them, are simply not effective. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So, one of our oldest friends in Israel was told by a former, very high-ranking elected official on the day that Netanyahu's mandate to form a government expired, that there would be both the conflicts with Hamas and riots within Israel. And I'm wondering if anyone else heard that. 
know, or the implication being that both of these situations were deliberately fomented by the government, uh, by Netanyahu, to preserve his government. This is some. This is what he was told when the day that Netanyahu's mandate expired that this would happen. Many people in Israel consulted Iran and me. Netanyahu is not one of them, so we don't know. Uh, I, I can say that there are uh, serious voices, very serious, oh. the Israeli media that say what you've just mentioned, Stuart. Is it true or not? I don't know. Are there any other questions, burning questions? I think not. I think we covered uh, the questions that were in the chat. Um, so at this point, I would like to thank Ron and Iran very, very much. We, uh, it was, was fascinating. I'm sure uh, you, uh, a lot of new things uh, were learned today. And um, thank you both.